All right, guys, and welcome to the 40th episode of Below the Bar. In this episode, expect to find out why alcohol would be illegal if it were discovered today, how much boozing costs the UK taxpayer every year, and what happens when you punch a window on a night out after necking a bottle of rum. Let's get into it. Hello, and welcome back to what is a bit of a throwback to our original Below the Bar format. Prepped episode, this a, one. A Fucking prepped episode crazy. with research and analysis and, and topic and uh, foresight. All sorts. It's actually brought about quite topically, actually, because Eddie's in Manchester to visit. Typically, that would mean we were doing one thing, wouldn't it, really? Yeah, drinking. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, not today, because... The fact I, we're not doing that is actually kind of related to the uh, the topic of the podcast, so... Well, I think it's weird, actually, because I think uh, since we've started this podcast, our attitudes towards drinking have sh- changed quite a bit. They have, yeah, they've shifted. Uh, I think that happens we're getting older anyway, to be honest, but we'll get into that. Well, we're not even that old, because there are people our age and people much older than us that are still kind of like piss cans. Yeah, it's true, it's true. I think mature, maybe mature, maturity then, because obviously age and maturity are different things, right? So I think as you mature, potentially, certainly like the wreckhead culture, Mm. goes out the window obviously people still have wine and like whatever on a night out on a night but I think the temptation to get blackout drunk <laughs> get, yeah. goes downhill a little bit doesn't it? I don't know we'll, we'll see about that so I want to open with a quote mm-hmm. and that's going to frame the rest of our discussion slash podcast okay. so I want the listeners to kind of bear this in mind when we're going through kind of our, our thoughts on alcohol and the yeah. statistics around it. Before we get into that, hold on, because we need to frame. If people are watching, they're like, "What's what's this a dog?" Oh, <laughs> there right, there yeah. is a dog on set. Um, so if there's any sort of random noises or, you know, I don't know, barking or whatever, that's what it is. Uh, we're, I'm currently dog sitting for one of my mates. Um, so that's what that is. But anyway, carry on. Better be on her best behaviour. Yeah, she's currently biting me, which is good. That's good. <laughs> right. Okay. So, alcohol would be declared an illegal drug if it were discovered today. Not my words, the words of David Nutt, Professor of Neuropsychopharmacology at Imperial College London, leading expert on UK drug policy and author of the book Drugs Without the Hot Air, which I highly recommend and has shaped a lot of the research that's gone into this podcast. Yeah, so it's typical that with one, one book shapes the majority of the research. But it's, it, it's, no, it's, a, it's, a, good, it's such it's a, a good, good book, so it's, a good book. it's kind of a one-hit one it wonder one it wonder one trick pony uh in all things kind of like drug drug related well, drug attitude pol- to drug related i guess isn't it like it's 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 about the perception of of drugs within society right i'm guessing yeah and how po- and how policy is well how those drugs have shaped policy and kind of like the yeah how they don't the, necessarily reflect the actual danger no because the classification system is absolutely mental isn't well, it? it's all politi- when you deconstruct it it's not it's not actually backed by science it's all political or data, or any any yeah. kind of... Uh, Which we will get into, but yeah, yeah, so bear that in mind. If alcohol were to be discovered today, would it would it be illegal? Yeah. And well, I think like, my argument is it probably would. It would prob- it, well, it would certainly be moderated more than it is. Yes, and also, no of the usual segments this week. We're going to we're gonna focus straight onto the nitty-gritty, because it, yeah, could, it could, get a bit, could get a bit drawn out otherwise. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, well, also, the fact is we're filming two in, in a weekend, and we... We need to spread out our, uh, our segments because they're hard to think of the best. Spread time, out right? our segments and our bandwidth. Yeah, exactly. Right, okay, so before we actually get into booze um, and kind of alcohol and our attitudes towards it and the kind of cost-benefit analysis of it, mm. what is a drug? Because, yeah. al- pro- you know... We need, to pre- we need to do some drug admin here. Because contrary to popular belief, alcohol is a drug. True. Well, so is a lot, I mean, a lot of things are drugs w- that are still accepted in in society. It's just, and again, this comes back to the perception of of these things, doesn't it? Because things like caffeine's obviously a, a drug or a psychoactive thing, and so is painkillers or whatever. So it's the devil's in the dose, isn't it? Is is kind of the the mm. trite saying. But yeah, so what what is a drug? There's, a, there's is there four categories? Well, so there's four. C- there's four. Through? Well, it depends who you ask. There's about seven classifications of drug, mm. but there's four main ones. Four major ones. But in terms of what actually is a drug, basically a substance which has a psychological effect when ingested or otherwise introduced into the body. So yeah, so again, that, that that's cro- so broad, right? Something that crosses like the blood-brain brain barrier, brain. Or, I guess. Yeah, so caffeine is a good example because that, yeah. that does so. so. Uh, and, and we ingest caffeine fucking loads. But, I mean, alcohol is one of those things, again, which is like... 
so heavily um <clears throat> so heavily ingested just by everyone without even thinking about it. So hopefully this podcast can bring a little bit of context to your consumption if anything, if nothing else. Yeah, we're throwing it back. There's actually research and science behind this podcast. Yeah. So you should actually learn something as well as being entertained, I hope. Yeah, well, and if you're watching, the dog's actually a retard, so I mean, sure, I'm sure, <laughs> sure we're entertained by that. Can you name the four main classifications of drug? So I know there's depressant. Yes. That's, that's what alcohol is. That's what that falls into. I don't know if... I'm sure psychedelics got its own kind of branch right is that like psychoactive or something no psychedelics are a classification, oh, is that a classification? Of drug? Yeah. okay cool um i'm guessing there's like some sort of word for an upper stimulant stimulant okay and then well, i don't know what the other one opioids ah uh, okay cool that makes sense okay so we've got, so we got opioids which kind of target the endorphin receptors in the brain creating a dreamy sense of well-being so that's why a lot of painkillers are opioids yep because it basically smacked off your teeth. Fentanyl and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, heroin, codeine, opium, they're all opioids. Then we've got stimulants, which kind of release something called amines, noradrenaline and dopamine, triggering a kind of flight or flight response. Is that like E? Yeah, so cocaine, amphetamine, caffeine, tobacco, they're all stimulants. Yep. Then we've got psychedelics, which is still something of a mystery, apparently. Yeah, well, I mean, they're, they're very... There's very limited research into psychedelics because they're so banded with a mad brush you know yeah again which goes into why drug policy makes no sense because it's not actually backed by science well because as we're learning now psychedelics can be leveraged actually for you know to not sort out but to look at depression and trauma and all this sort of stuff because obviously you have set pathways in the way you think and that's why you maybe experience depression or experience whatever and so sometimes delivering a psychoactive substance into the brain can make you think in a different way and then you can start to have, have new uh, new realisations which which happens and, and he's getting discovered a little bit more nowadays now things are a bit more progressive but hasn't been for fucking years because they've just been they've just been like um, stigmatised yeah so there's a lot more research now going into how psychedelics can be used in a positive manner in regards to mental health and kind of like PTSD rehabilitation and stuff but again, none yeah. of this is really in the mainstream yet because it's so kind of morally frowned upon from the perspective of policymakers, which is frustrating. True. Well, I mean, the issue probably is that more so that policymakers are generally old-fashioned thinkers and, and pretty old people, and that that tends to be like it tends to be like the younger, more progressive generation that are pushing these things. Whereas what? people who generally make policy aren't aren't those people. Well, I don't, I don't think it's the age thing. I think it's just the fact that it's so politicised. Like the people that are making policy are in government and therefore have an agenda. Fair, so like, yeah, under true. New Labour, cannabis was very close to becoming decriminalised. But then mm. when Tony Blair stepped down and Gordon Brown stepped into office. To then win votes at the upcoming general election, Gordon Brown basically U-turned on, on the decrim, yeah, yeah, because he knew it would be a vote winner. So again, but then if he'd followed True. the sci- if he'd followed the science, it would it should have gone through as being decrim. Well, it's that old sort of comparison between that and alcohol in terms of fatalities and, and spend and all that sort of stuff is, is ridiculous. So there's really not a lot of arguments for that being criminalised, and in America, certain parts of America, it's not, is it? No. So the fact we haven't followed them is interesting as well, isn't it? Because we typically follow America in everything. Um, and so in places like California, you can have fucking. Well, our like drug pol- our drug policies as they are now are modelled on the American system, well, the traditional the American original, system, yeah, yeah, yeah. which yeah. is basically criminalise everything. Criminalise <laughs> everything. Don't treat drug users as kind of medical patients. Treat them as criminals. Yeah, uh, and there's there's interesting. There's a couple of interesting like back and forth between um well one of them's between matthew perry and what's his name that uh oh fucking hell i can't remember his name um he's like a super con- conservative um journalist hitchens pete hitchens is that his name yeah yeah so pete hitchens so those two had i mean matthew perry's obviously sadly passed away now i think probably I mean, it wasn't wasn't really publicized was it probably because of something to do with that because he struggled with that addiction all his life oh he was a cocaine addict wasn't he uh alcoholic as well oh an alcoholic yeah yeah all so he them. he was an alcoholic so i mean he obviously had lived experience and had a viewpoint of these people are addicts with a sort of medical issue so they need help to wean themselves off this rather than just saying okay we're going to crim- criminalize it and that's going to be the deterrent whereas peter hitchens was obviously of the the right hand stance where he was like actually um this is something where if you make it completely 
completely illegal and make the punishments really, really bad, ramp it up, then that'll scare people off. Obviously, that doesn't work. Right? No, it doesn't work. Because if you've got a chemical hook that you're just like, okay, I'm just addicted, you're going to do whatever to, to, to score something, which was Matthew Perry's point. But there's some interesting back and forth on YouTube you can go and have a look at. Well, yeah, but if you think about it in any other way, like if someone got like diabetes or cancer and you, and you penalise them and punish them for it, you wouldn't get very far in terms of actually helping that individual overcome their illness. No, no, exactly. No. You got to um, treat. You got to treat addiction like almost a, the same thing. It's, almost it's the same. Because if you just lock, lock them in prison, they'll just keep using in prison. And also, locking people away from the perspective of the tax pay, which we'll get onto, is the most expensive way to deal with drug drug addiction. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's another thing. I think we've spoken about it before on the pod, but it's relevant. Is the the Vietnam War thing? with the, the heroin use um, and so like I think it's you know about 95% of US soldiers because of how stressful and horrendous the Vietnam War was were regularly using opioids to get themselves through that when they came back from active service about 2% of them basically carried on that use which, which tells you basically that it's not so much a chemical hook it's more a um, an environment thing so if you're super stressed and you, you have nothing really going for you you're going to turn to drugs if you give someone purpose, family, etc., which they had when they came back to the states, they stopped using, which is which is just completely anti to whatever the the drug policy and and the dogma that is that's pushed around it. Mm. Yeah. So you got so so what have we done? We have done opioids. We've done so we psychedelics. So we've done stim- yeah we've done stimulants yeah. as well. And then so we've got the last one, which is depressant, which is uh, alcohol benzodiazepines something called GHB which is apparently a date rape drug which I wasn't that familiar with uh, it, that is short for some fancy Latin name that I can't pronounce and won't try and pronounce uh, basically depressants activate the GABA receptors which turn the brain off which is effectively why well, it's a suppressant well that's why people use alcohol for like to get over anxiety isn't it I guess because anxiety is effectively your brain just fucking going and going and going and going whirring and so it just brings that down a little bit and then you start to feel a little bit more calm. Yeah, well, your suppressants basically suppress you, which well, is yeah. why alcohol poisoning is so dangerous because, yeah, alcohol chills you out after a few pints, but the more you drink, the more relaxed you get to the point where you literally just, like, it just switches your brain off. Like, well, that's yeah, how you, you die. Functioning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you stop bodily functions, just stop happening. Yeah. Yeah, so alcohol is the most widely used depressant. However, it also releases noradrenaline. So it kind of, it transcends depressants into stimulants, which is why when you drink initially, you get that kind of like buzz feeling before you then kind of relapse back into feeling well, suppressed. Well, an inverted U, isn't there? Like you yeah. go on the climb, don't you? And then you hit, hit the certain peak and then you fucking die. Uh, and obviously, as we all know, the hangover is, is, obviously, is, is that sort of depressant thing coming in. Uh, I don't really know why the hangover does affect your emotions so much do you know anything about that I, I know what affects your body because it's a toxin well I know you're that I, mean, I know yourself. why you feel horrendous I mean you're like headache and dehydrated and stuff but I don't know why well, in my, it's my experience anyway that when you wake up if you have any sort of thing going on in your life that's semi stressful or, or you can be thinking about you're all, all, almost always going to be anxious about it and always going to be more um, the the depression or whatever it is is going to be more pronounced when you're on a hangover. I'm not sure why negative emotion is is so upregulated when you're hum- when you're hungover. Won't it be the fact that kind of like any drug though it alters your brain chemistry to some extent, so it just knocks you off kilter a bit. Yeah, I mean probably because yeah. because w- as soon as you're off that hangover, you feel back to kind of back to normal again emotionally, which is strange. I mean, it's not like on again shock. We're not experts in this subject matter. We're just basically... No, we're just relaying our lived experience. Regurg- regurgitating other people's knowledge and then inputting our own lived experience. But, yeah, so alcohol is particularly damaging to the liver and the brain because the body breaks alcohol down into a toxin called acetaldehyde. Nice. I hadn't heard of that. Yeah, <laughs> that's the toxin. Okay. Uh, so when people say particularly my parents anyway all all <laughs> aimed at your parents this podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty much so in older generations kind of have i don't know what would be termed kind of an old-fashioned view of alcohol well, they don't perceive it to yeah. be yeah. a drug let alone something that's poisoning you effectively you can go back to them with that yeah and then bamboozle well with a word they won't yeah. understand uh so you were saying which is quite a good point the other day with about kind of the relationship between people's perception of nicotine like about 30 years ago or whatever before it got 
uh, not decriminalised, but you know, stigmatised to the point it is now, um, where people were just like happy to smoke. Everyone fucking smoked, and no one gave a shit. Um, and then now, obviously, you see someone smoking, you think, "Fucking hell, are you an idiot!" Like, what you like? Most people think like, think that way. Alcohol's probably on the same trajectory, just about thirty years behind. Where, like, your parents' generation, well, our parents' generation, just aren't on on that wavelength. They're just living in that old bubble of alcohol's fine, everyone drinks. It's just a done thing. Whereas I think our generation are realizing actually the f- the effects of it, the effects on your brain, the effects on your body, uh, and are starting to take it less and less. Yeah, I think these things almost take generations to kind of pass through into societal norms, basically. Yeah, definitely. Like you said, Part with, of the culture. with smoking, and I think a lot of cultural norms really die out with older generations and then get kind of brought in through younger generations. So like alcohol now, like the majority of people our age or potentially a few years younger that we were saying this, so like we were old enough... We had that clubbing experience slightly before COVID. Yeah, well, quite a, quite a while. Quite a while, a good yeah. few years. But I think people who either turned 18 or were just turning 18 through that weird few years of COVID now have very different attitudes towards drinking. Yeah, I would agree. I'm not sure why that is, but I think it's just the more awareness, I just think more they weren't, about it. I just think, don't think they, because they, in their early kind of adulthood, weren't socialised in alcohol environments like pubs and clubs. Yeah, so it's a bit like you were saying at the start. Would it, would it be criminalised now? Or would it be as normal and as commonplace now if if it came in uh, these days and if it was invented now? But uh, I think there's definitely a part, like an element of that because it was like a two and a half year period where they couldn't really indulge in that al- that culture, the alcohol culture that that we we had when we were like eighteen. But I think I think a lot of drinking in the UK, especially, is the product just of it being the norm. I think people oh, yeah. just go through the motions with it. Like, you think how hard it is to get like a birthday card when you turn eighteen or twenty-one that doesn't reference booze of some kind. You know, oh, that doesn't have like a yeah. pint on it or like a bottle of wine because it's just it's just the given norm, isn't it? Well, it's like the big thing you can now do legally, which is kind of, I guess, can you you can drive seventeen? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I guess it's the big um thing that was illegal and now just isn't and and, they, and they, you're expected almost to do to go and indulge in that now uh now you you kind of legally can but we well, we know that it's not you're not just not doing it until you're 18 you're doing it all the time so it's a bit of a strange one but you're right yeah but the birthday card thing is a good point because that's sort of informative of how the culture around it um, is 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 taking taking place isn't it well, it, it's actually mental when you unpack it though because I'm well actually but like it's kind of a, it's kind of a tradition that when you turn eighteen or whatever, like your parents will take you for your first like legal pint in a pub or whatever, which is mental because that's like basically them buying you like a fucking bag of coke. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Imagine if you turn if you mm. turned eighteen, or if you had a mate right who turned eighteen and his dad had bought him a bag for his eighteen, you'd think that is the most dysfunctional parenting <laughs> relationship going. Yeah. But there's no real difference. Like is there not? coke is just as bad for you as alcohol. See, I I have a mo- I have a block with that thinking about is it? But it probably is. But I mean, they're both it, that's po- they're both poisoning your body. Yeah, I guess is one of them more of a gateway to other stuff. Probably not because I think alcohol is probably a gateway to coke culturally. But like, right, what's the James Smith argument? Isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, who yeah. Or, who orders a bag of coke sober? sober? No one. So that's what I mean. So like, it's culturally. I think if you if you are that way inclined that you're going to be smashing cocaine, it's probably as a byproduct of. <laughs> Smashing alcohol first, yeah. right? So if you're about to turn 18 and you don't want to drink, ask your mom to get you a bag of Ket instead. Yeah, great advice, that. Clip that up. <laughs> and, uh, we'll have that on TikTok. Uh, so, I yeah, I know. I, it's a weird thing. But again, it's such a norm for your, your kind of dad to go and buy you buy you first pint. But yeah, and again, yeah. again, especially for my parents are very kind of liberal with, not that they're fucking piss cans, but like, because it's just the norm for their generation. A lot of their socialising revolves around the consumption of alcohol. Also, spend a lot of time in France. You spend a lot of time <laughs> in France. Well, you think we'll get onto this. The French have actually kind of reimagined their relationship with alcohol. So, if the French can do well, it, true. we can do it. They're, they're, yeah, they're not wine connoisseurs, are they? Now that we've kind of gone over what drugs are, how alcohol fits into the network of drugs, a mm-hmm. bit of an overview of what we now think about alcohol. I want to backtrack and talk about 
how our relationship with alcohol has formed over the years. Cool. Well, we said at the start of the that like, uh, even since starting the podcast about a year ago, our viewpoints and relationship with alcohol has changed a fair bit. So it's probably worth going through some of the experiences that have, that have kind of become a catalyst for that. Yes. Um, so basically, this is a good opportunity for us to throw ourselves under the bus. I think Europe was a bit of a thing, you know. Really? You know we travelled Europe. So that was quite tame. No, it was, but I think like oh, I was in like a moment of realization. Mm, yeah, yeah. Totally. oh yeah, definitely, yeah. So like, example would be in was it in Munich? Yeah, we went to the beer houses, and that was just like because we were we were both on beer because obviously that's all you can get there. <laughs> yeah, and and that mate, basically makes us both threaders the entire time. Yeah, I can't drink beer, and the the associated hangover is always worse. I think a couple of those like hungover grotty mornings in the, in a hostel I was just like I can't keep doing this you know what I mean like I was, I was like it's a good it's a, it's enjoyable okay fine but once you get like I said once you get past a certain point of maturity I feel that you just like fucking you know, your standards for yourself well I think it was like a prolonged period of drinking wasn't it so like we'd had so we were kind of acutely aware of how our attitudes towards alcohol were changing and since that moment, we'd had like sporadic nights out, mm. but I think it was like the compounding effect of like back to back piss ups, basically. Yeah. Where, where we yeah, just yeah. like became like very apparent, like this was not for us anymore. Disillusioned by yeah. the idea of going out, even even like so, twenty one year old or nineteen year old rocking up to like Hamburg, you're like fucking, hell, I can't wait to get on the piss. Yeah. We were rocking up to Hamburg for our last weekend. We're like, oh, fucking hell. Broken, broken like, arges. We like, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll go out once. Like, we'll go out once. Like, fuck, that is bizarre. Uh, and it, I don't think it is a function of being just older. I think it is a little bit of like a, a realisation where it's like how much do you actually get from it versus how much does it take from you? Yeah, it's, it's just... A, it's a cost-benefit analysis. It's not, it's not something that comes with age. It's something that comes with a shift in your values. That doesn't nest. That's not necessarily True. determined by age, yeah, is it? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Because uh, there, there are people that are like our parents age or even older that would like be watering at the mouth of a prospect of like a piss up in Hamburg yeah I can't help but feel sometimes that's driven by escapism more than anything else potentially I mean everyone has their reasons for drinking don't they yeah but I just think by that point because you haven't done it for so long maybe you know uh, there's a bit of novelty in there as well But like, so why did you used to drink like back in day because so, you were quite proli- we were both quite prolific binge drinkers certainly with the military I was fucking terrible I think always, I I always have a weird like, um, well, a pretty bad FOMO sort of feeling. So there's always that thing of if there's a night out, there is potential for it to be really, really good. And I'm, because I'm always like optimistic and glass half full, I always think about the potential for it to be like the best night ever. And there is always that that, that 2% of it could happen. And so I always would say yes to like Friday, Saturday, fa- Friday, Saturday night for most weekends. I would not miss one because I was like, well, it could be fucking the best night of my life. Yeah. And it rarely was. I'll tell you were playing the numbers game there, weren't you? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, that. statistically, yes. I had some good nights. You right? go out every Friday and Saturday of every weekend. You're going to have some good nights out. You're also going to have. But how many some... are you going to have that are shit? And if you do a cost benefit analysis of that, I'm thinking, well, well what? God, basically, you basically written off every weekend there. Yeah. For... I, mean, I think, to be honest, the. At the time, I don't think I regretted it or felt, you know, like I should have been doing anything else. Because I was younger, kind of minimal responsibilities and stuff. And it's just, again, like it's in the culture of the Marines, baked in. But the thing that did suffer was, of course, my bank account, right? I, I could have had far more saved up when I, by the time I left the call than I did because I just spent every fucking last penny on booze yeah. or on trips or, or whatever, which was fucking great fun. But And I think, again... It comes back to like the Bill Perkins thing we we talk about like that consumption smoothing thing where you can you can earn far more later on in your life. So yeah, actually saving that extra two grand when I was nineteen fucking didn't really matter because it does you know that pales into ins- insignificance later on down the line. So I don't think I actually regret it, but I think it's a necessary evil sometimes to go and do that and like commit almost to all that to that life of debauchery. and then you can figure out because you then got it out of your system, haven't you? Because yeah. it's, it's there, it's always pent up, it's there. So getting out of your system not having that like open loop of thinking actually what's that what's that sort of life like going out all the time is, is kind of important I think there was very much for people our age and older there was a because alcohol because going out to the pub and drinking was so normalised you would miss out socially if you didn't drink 
or yeah, alert, correct, yeah. or at least w- weren't comfortable being in those environments sober. sober or and also the the prevalence of like non-alcoholic beer wasn't really as good yeah, and shit. <laughs> yeah and it wasn't just it wasn't a thing it just wasn't a, d- a done thing so th- you were always going to miss out if you didn't booze i think that's probably changed now for younger people because there's not so much of a pre- i mean obviously we can't talk for people that are younger than us but from what i've got ga- from what I've gathered, there's not so much pressure on people to drink anymore. I just also think as well, it might be a good function of social media sometimes, because it wasn't as prevalent when we were younger at all. No. Now it was, it's everywhere. Well, it was very much binge drinking culture. It wasn't just like, if you drink, you're cool. Whereas mm. now it's almost like, if you drink, you're like, you're a bit troubled. A bit of a know? loser. Yeah, you're a bit of a yeah. loser. Which is, it depends which is what a... side of TikTok you kind of, or t- side of social media you kind of consume. But I think the majority, there's a big veneration for wholesome activities and... yeah. You know, being productive and all this sort of stuff. Like Andrew Tate being like, don't fucking waste your life and get pissed all the time. Go and actually do something. I know he's a bit of an extreme example, but obviously he had loads and loads of following, or well, massive following for, for a reason. So people like Jordan Peterson are always like fucking, you know, take some personal responsibility. Let's do something with your life rather than seeing well, it go to, to, go to well, waste. I, well, I think kind of stuff. both those people are hats, to be honest. I'd use Chris Williamson as a good example. I'm just saying, but those people have had a massive following. And the reason for that, is because there's a place for that message. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know whether it was their kind of anti-drinking message that people were getting behind. No, I think it was, the misogy- that was it was it was jaded bitter men getting behind the misogyny. That, I think that's what kind of yeah. Grew I mean, their not presence. not with Jordan Peterson, I wouldn't say, but definitely with Andrew Tate. Yeah, Jordan Peterson's not that not not that fucking extreme. It, it just no, depends it, depends on what he's talking about. He's a hat. Uh, for me, I think you're right in terms of like actually moment of realization when we went to Europe. I was at the end of my tether. Uh, yeah, you had a few low, low days. That was a low point, I think. So waking up <laughs> with a stinking hangover. Can you overlay that fault. Okay, oh, you have more ad, more edit. Yeah, I okay. Maybe People I'll... will have seen it. It's on my Instagram. If you want to see me at my lowest, is that on your fitness Insta? Oh no, it's the one of me and I. Oh, the, be. the, the better photo actually is of me and I and Apple after fourteen days of a piss, right. which is what I was going to get into now. Okay, yeah. It's kind of like if I had to. I had to identify a moment where I kind of like reached pink, like peak, like binge drinking. Yeah, it was definitely that hot, that lads' holiday. You had a bit, of a, a bit of a prolific period around that as well, you know. Uh, yeah, after my second major breakup, mm. I basically just went on the war path with drink. You did, didn't you? Yeah, so you like were quite strong. So like every Friday and Saturday, and me, me and certain individuals, yeah, they know who they are. They we, will remain there. We had we had a little bit of a drinking gang going on back home. And it would just be nailed on that every like Friday and Saturday we'd go out. Yeah, yeah. For for the period of about like six to nine months, which built up to Iron Apple, and then that was like the crescendo. Uh, and then I tapered off, to be fair, because like mm. it, like you were saying, just about like you need to get it out your system. Turns out for me, fourteen days in Iron Apple was enough. Got it out your system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and ever ever since then, my relationship with alcohol has started to shift. Yeah. To the point where as like I kind of reached my climax when we were into railing yeah i guess that's probably a good um a good trajectory i was in a functioning relationship at that point so i was uh yeah you so I, like I you was fine. you weren't privy to any of these no because exactly. if you were single you would have definitely been a degenerate 100 percent. but the thing is actually in that so some people because i'm quite i think i'm quite impressionable to be honest i think in some relationships if one party drinks that relationship just fucking becomes a drinking relationship. They go to Tenerife, they get the one pound pints in. Whatever. Oh, I've been there. Yeah, exactly. So the thing is with that relationship, that individual didn't really drink. And I think that helped, to be honest. I was, so before that, I remember she, like, when I was texting her before we got together, I was like, I was out all the time. She was a bit worried. She was like, the fucking, is he a fucking alcoholic? Yeah. yeah. Well, the, irony, like, the irony is though, you did meet in a nightclub. Yeah, it's, that is ironic. But, <laughs> I mean, she got dragged there. I was there all the fucking time. But then after that, because I didn't really have I just didn't really have the because to spend time with her in order to do that I wouldn't kind of be able to spe- be able to spend that time away and, and drink and whatever so it just didn't have the pull and so I think over time that sort of just detracted my need for any any sort of alcohol and also we had COVID during that time which again you can't drink and so I think that period of time of like three years where I really didn't booze yeah you did I mean obviously I'm not gonna I'm not gonna demonise you now because that kind of goes against the whole message of this podcast but throughout that period when I was getting on it you were a bit boring. 
Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, I don't think you were boring now. I think you were making good choices. But from the perspective of me back then, well, I bet he it did, was yeah. frustrating. Cause yeah. like, you like, can't fucking can't get him out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, the thing was as well, which helped actually, if, if that relationship was existing in the same postcode, yeah. it would have been different. But you were removed from the immediate vicinity of piss yeah. can culture. Well, that's it. There was a lot of things actually that, that sort of stats on top of each other to help. Cause, so I'd work weekends early morning. So if I did come out, I'd always drive across. I would drink a bit maybe and then I'd have to drive back. So I would never be able to fully hang one on um, unless I booked a day off, which I uh, which I never really did. So I think there was a lot of things going on. Um, and at the time, I definitely sometimes saw that as a bit of a drawback because I couldn't really spend time with my mates who were like 50 minutes away. Yeah, you had like a trifecta of like perfect excuses not to booze yeah, really because yeah. your job meant that you couldn't. You, had to, you lived far away so you always had to drive yeah. and your missus didn't drink. So like she was never with you so it was always like well I've kind of left her at home yeah Not exactly yeah so, so there was there was times where I went to like I would meet the lads in but in Birmingham which was quite, kind of equidistant for both of us well not really closer for me but like and that would be workable but then I would always stumble into work fucking hungover so it's like there's no real upside here because I'm now having to deliver my ACM session and I'm fucking hanging so yeah yeah. Anyway. It's, oh, mate, I used to wear like hangovers and being <laughs> Like a prolific binge drinker as a bit of a badge of honour for a while. I think I think that is common. It's mad because I felt and probably looked like shit. A lot of people do that with like their physical health though. Like, yeah. oh, you know, I slept two hours last night. Oh, well, great. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's like, terrible. You know, not not. It's almost sometimes in some circles probably seen. You know, taking care of your body and maybe eating healthy and eating whatever and going to the gym as a bit. Not nerdy or whatever, you know, a bit of kind of yeah. bit square, a bit square in it, bit square, like a bit like ball, bit straight edge, a bit boring. Like that's too easy, not, yeah. too easy if you like, like do it like the condition, like the conventional way. Sorry, yeah, like you got to make it hard for yourself, like train hungover. Yeah, so yeah. you like sleep eight hours a night. You fuck it, of course you can do that. You know, what do mean? it on like four hours of poor quality sleep, entirely like dehydrated. Yeah, yeah. And obviously get a shit session in yeah, the middle of it. It's a bit like that in the military from what I can gather. Oh yeah, mate. If you can't do it hungover, you can't do it. Yeah. That's a, that's an actual thing people say. Uh which I guess obviously has no place, but I mean in that kind of in the current culture, that really is the case. Because if you have like a troop piss up and then fizz in the morning, you still have to be able to perform. Or do it anyway. Not that you'll perform very well, but I think some people lend themselves better to do, doing that as well. I witnessed the most mental thing actually. Uh, this was after a night out, and he was still he. This guy, right? So I'm not naming, but he was on the way out. He was like, this was his last week, and we had a range package down in straight no, somewhere down South Wales anyway, near Tenby, so mega hilly, and we had this thing called the gun run we'd have to do, which was like, which was typically two miles with the GPMG, which is awkward as fuck to carry, and then like I don't know twenty kilos extra, but it was just really awkward and typically you have to do two miles so the idea was for this guy's leaving thrashing whatever mm. he would do he would come in hungover 6am and then 8am we stepped off on this thing it was supposed to be two miles the idea was from the stripey was to basically break him yeah. he was like I'm gonna just go until he breaks probably be about a mile because he's fucked bloke was like an ex semi-pro rugby player so he's a fucking beast mate we went for eight miles I was like, <laughs> how the fuck is... I was hanging. I was like, I'm dangling here and I'm just running body weight. He was like draped in a gun. He was like crawling across the thing. I was like, fucking hell. Um, so there is that massive culture and that was hugely celebrated, as you can imagine. Yeah, it's uh, weird that people are kind of like venerated for their ability to dig out on the piss and dig out doing fizz in the military. Yeah. Because they're just yeah. the antithesis of each other. Well, exactly. Which I guess is why it's so kind of admirable. But at the same time, like... Your profession basically is to stay fit. So, if they had their head screwed on, yeah, like drink like binge drinking would be discouraged. It's true. I think I've always made an argument for involving yourself in that sort of thing in training, just because it lubricates the social setting. It makes sure it makes it easier to form bonds with people. Because um, from a purely like Royal Marines training standpoint, in the week you're very like it's very professional relationship. It's very busy. Mm during the weekend is where you can actually like talk about things actually fucking like get to know people and all that sort of stuff so I think there is a place for it in that environment but I think you're also right like it's you know it's ridiculous because you're not sleeping anyway 
and then you're going to go out on the weekend when you could sleep and have shit sleep. So it's like, what the fuck? But yeah, I mean, there is there is that. Well, the idea of alcohol being a social lubricant brings us neatly on to our next section, which is a cost-benefit analysis of booze from the individual and societal perspective. Okay, which so is looking ma- good for booze. My little... T- <laughs> yeah, I'm not a betting man, <laughs> but I think, I think I know who's going to come out on top here. So I've split this into four categories. So we've got positives from the individual and the societal Okay. And then we've got negatives from the individual and the societal. Okay. So we might as well start with the positives from the individual to start yeah. with, because you already mentioned it. Social lubricant. Social lubricant. That's the only one I can think of. Well, it's literally the only reason, isn't it? Yeah. A bit of, maybe a bit of anxiety relief, maybe, in, in the moment. But then, obviously, as we said before, like, when you wake up and go over, it's 10x, so it's really not that much of a problem. Yeah, okay, okay. So social lubricant is somewhat under the umbrella of kind of like relaxation isn't it I guess well I guess so like it you chills could, you, you out argue, yeah you could argue like social anxiety could be solved so like. under that you can also put like escapism so potentially if you drink to escape your yeah. reality because you don't like your job or whatever that all it all comes under the umbrella yeah, of basically I mean, chilling the fuck out and this is funny though because isn't it like isn't all aren't all of those things a sign that you could you should engage in different behaviours so the example is like on dates if you have to drink on dates shouldn't you be dating different people yeah you know, and, and and the same is true. Like, if you have to drink to get away from your job, shouldn't you fucking try and find a different job? Like, it's it's one of those things. Like, surely look at the root cause rather than thinking, oh, well, I can just medicate with alcohol. But, yeah, but again, though, it's all just kind of like short term thinking, isn't it? Because, like you said, yeah, so you drink true. in the minute, but then like you just basically kicking the can further down the road. So you Absolutely. wake up feeling twice as worse, and then all of all of the issues that are making you drink in the first place hit you like a train when you wake up. Yeah, uh, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. So like that's, and, and again, it's a vicious circle. You go out on a Friday, wake up Saturday morning, everything's closing in on you. The demons, it's as, as our mate says, horrible. And then, but then, but then you get back on it because then they go again. And then yeah. Sunday, everything just hits you like a fucking freight train. You're on again till Thursday. Night. <laughs> I've got, I've got, I've, been a th- I've got a good fucking dick actually. I want to spin this because it's funny. Yeah, I won't name any names, <laughs> but this kind of, this just stands out as a moment for me that is just like so fucking like if you actually unpack it <laughs> like this this type of behavior could only be normalized in britain where okay. from the age of like 18 to 25 like it's just accepted that you're gonna be a bit of a piss can yeah so it, this is what somewhat an individual who's in my particular drinking gang that we just mentioned when we go out like every friday and saturday mm-hmm. so he was like he didn't right he wasn't even talking to this bird right <laughs> It wasn't, they, were like, they just they just flirt on a night out. Okay, I'm gonna try and figure out who it is. Right, you'll know the story. <laughs> when you get to it. And like, if anyone who we know watches this story, they'll get it in the end. So the, he wasn't even talking to this bird. Right, they just flirt. Mm. So there's there's no kind of like in real interest. In there's it. no real interest. There's no commitment there either. They're no. not in a relationship, right? So, <laughs> so we've got hammered shock. Yeah. Which again, pre-drinking is dangerous. We'll get into pre-drinking in a bit, but we've ba- we've basically drank a lot and then gone out mm-hmm. and drank more. Mm-hmm. So it's reached the end of the night, and there's a big group of us, uh, and he's absolutely paralytic. And he's seen this bird who he flirts with, but he's not with, and like has no commitment to. Yeah, talking, uh, okay, talking to another bird, talking to another bloke who's our friend, <laughs> right. Nothing's happened. They're just talking. So, like, you know, at the end of the night when you get to the kebab shop mm. and, like, everyone's just milling about because like, sort of the club's closed or whatever, but you don't want to go home yet. Yeah. So, you're just milling around with your kebab or whatever. Right. He's seen this and lost his head. Right. Right. Again, it, at no point prior to this has he shown any kind of, like, social or public demonstration of affection <laughs> for this bird. Right. So, like, unless she's a mind reader. He, yeah, that he's is, not. She's no not gonna one, know. No one is to know that he actually has like feelings for her, right? So he's seen her talking to this bloke, mm. right? And immediately dropped his kebab and made a beeline for the nearest window and just punched it. Ah, uh, that's not even punched him. Like, yeah. I have more respect for that. <laughs> yeah. If he like, you know, knocked his kebab out of his hand or whatever, and then showed some actual but, interest. Right. In so he's so he's punched a single pane window of a bank, right? And it's obviously smashed. Because yeah. he's like a grown bloke and he's yeah. just thrown all of his weight <laughs> behind this punch, right? So he's now got a lacerated hand. Yeah. Like he's pissing blood basically from his hand. Yeah. So for the next like two or three hours, right, we've now gone, we've got a taxi straight to the hospital. Uh. We've sat in A&E with him. He's had to get his hand glued together temporarily. And then the, and then he gets better now. So you're thinking, right, this is a pretty low point yeah. now. It can't get any worse than this. Yeah. 
He's woken up, hung over. He's supposed to go back to the hospital to get his hand properly stitched up. Chinned it off. Because he's hung over. Because he's hung over and he's not thinking straight. Gone to the gym with me, trained, and then later that night we've gone out again. Fuck, that's ridiculous. If there's ever an advert, advertisement for not boozing, it's got like that's ridiculous. But in it? certain circles, right, that behaviour is venerated. Oh, yeah, what, what a lad. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. But like, if you actually unpack it for what it is, that is highly destructive behaviour. Stupid. <laughs> like, there's no part of that, that that has any semblance of logic at all. Is and he's still mad? got a massive fuck off scar on his hand. Yeah, he's pretty, Com- pr- pretty proud of that. Completely needless, that. Pretty proud of that. He's yeah, like, yeah, showing that to the boys. He knows who he is. Anyone listening knows who it is. Yeah, but, that's good. But I that mean, just stands out as like... Well, it's alcohol informing bad decisions. Exactly. Which happens every single night, all the fucking time. So, uh, yeah, it's, and everyone's like... Everyone's experienced that, whether you've watched someone do something ridiculous or whether you've done something yourself that you regretted the next morning. Could be someone, you know, who knows. Um, that, but, anyway, that just stands out as like a, a moment of like an action or moment of behaviour that I've witnessed that's made me take a step back and think this is a bit weird now. Because I'm not, yeah. I'm quite good for that. So like I'll, I'll do something stupid in terms of like, uh, like, like just like, I don't want to, the politically incorrect term, but like mongy behaviour basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I don't get aggressive when I drink. Yeah. So I don't really have any of those moments where I've like caused a Neither fight. Neither do I. I don't, not at all. Because like, they normally have the most repercussions. Well, yeah. When you get into yeah, kind of like yeah, a scrap yeah, or like you punch something, because then you're causing physical harm. Mm. If your default when you're drunk is just to basically be a bit of an idiot, it, it's silly. actually quite dangerous because you never have that kind of like. It's region, wake it's up. region B, well, isn't it? You never have that wake up call. Exactly. Like, if you woke up in a cell because you banged someone out, you're probably like, ah. I should probably stay. I should probably, I'll probably stay in tonight. You know what I mean? Like, but if you're just always, oh, you've done something stupid, like you've messaged a bird, yeah. or like you've stolen a traffic cone. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's, it's always stupid, and it's like, well, I'm literally no better for that, and probably a, a net loss, but it's not so bad to the but, point yeah, really where you bit, need yeah. to have an intervention. 100%, yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like it's not completely deplorable behaviour where you, you are thinking, oh, fucking hell, you know, I'm really regretting that. I'm really kind of... But you're, you're a bit like... That wasn't my best self, was it? You know, that wasn't that wasn't what I what I meant to do in that ca- that occasion. Uh, but that wasn't what I'd ad- advise myself to do in that in that situation. But yeah, I, it's it's I don't know. It's one of those things. Like, again, I think there is an element of you do need to get it out of your system, and these little experiences, these little things that you, you know, these little things that you do regret maybe inform. Uh, so ah, uh, so the butterfly effect is a real thing. So our uh, like now felt sense of what alcohol is mm. and how we feel about it, our relationship to. It is only a function of our, our experiences with it but if yeah. we hadn't have had those we wouldn't probably feel the same yeah, it's, it's one of those things I don't know um, it's a tightrope isn't it yeah because it it's like there's is, there is so many examples of times I've gone out where I could have just been slightly more moderate with my drinking and had just as much fun but not fucked it Oh Do you yeah, know what I mean, but yeah, then that's, yeah, that's yeah. this. Yeah. This is the, what the whole podcast is about. It's the idea that when you drink, you can't make those sensible decisions. True. Actually, yeah, and it, I get that is very individual. I think because I'm fairly good at not getting absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, like, not. yeah, you're not at all. You're you're in or out, aren't you? Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty good at like knowing I'm on a level. Okay, I'm enjoying myself. Cool. I won't really drink anymore. Certainly now, anyway. Like past when I was like 22, I probably learnt that. And and that's a good place to be, but it still now doesn't serve me because I'm like, okay, well, I'm sort of enjoying myself, but I could have drank even less and still enjoy myself. So it's one of those. Yeah. Things. yeah, yeah. But anyway, so if, if we can, if we accept that basically the only positive from the individual perspective is kind of social lubricant, the fact yes. that it chills you out a bit. Yes. Let's now move on to societal positives. <laughs> the only one that I could think of, and this is the one that kind of the drink, the drink industry always pedals to government. Right. It's taxation. Yeah. Yeah, that's isn't that why it was kind of wasn't that part of the reason it was legalised initially? No? Well it's just always been legalised. Not we've in America. Never, well, I'm not on about America though. Like we've never had a period of prohibition in no, in Britain because we've always been piss cans. <laughs> yeah, okay. But so in the I, UK, I so like when, so. when the drinks industry comes under pressure, they always just come back with the taxation. But if you unpack it, it's, well, actually, yeah. it's a false economy because yeah. of the amount, amount of money you spend on various things right so Healthcare, policing policing council costs for count, people yeah, fucking exactly. shit up like exactly it's, 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 it's a mental. complete fucking false economy basically yeah uh, um, but I think 
there's a lot of that kind of thing. It's the same with like the gun argument in America. You know the NRA are like, well, you know, you tax it and whatever. They they're gonna fund a bit of the 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 campaign, but actually, the amount of probably spending they have to do on police call outs or whatever whatever it may be. You know, yeah. there's obviously 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 things that go wrong. Uh, so I think it is one. It's a, it's politicized again, isn't it? I think that's that's the only thing. But like you said, if you unpack it even slightly, you can't have can't make an argument for it. Can you? And I was trying to make the argument for like bringing people together and stuff, but then. The counter argument to that is instances like when the World Cup's on and, you know, England invariably go out. And then because everyone's been pissed and now that they're absolutely fuming that England have been knocked out of a major tournament, like domestic violence cases go up by like 500%. Yeah, that's true. And that's just a product that's of drink. A, yeah, it's a product of drink and it's a product of just fucking idiots. Though, isn't it? It's like, that's that's like, it's, there's almost an argument for there, there for like, would those people just be knobheads anyway? Because they're obviously no beds. Well, probably not without the drink, though. Maybe. I guess that's a catalyst for their behaviour. But, like, society can only move at the pace of the slowest person, can't it? Like, not everyone in America is shooting up high schools. No. But, true. unfortunately, when you make AR-15s accept- accessible to most people in a Walmart, you know, you're setting yourself up to failure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. Most people can drink responsibly. But some people But can't. some people can't, and, unfortunately... You've got to tow. You've got to tow the line the, to the, the slowest person. The interesting thing is, though, that's why drugs are illegal, isn't it? That's why you know, like cocaine. That's why that's illegal because some people can take it and be fine. Some people can't, and they overdose and they die. Yeah. Well, it's the same with alcohol, isn't it? Really, it's well, just that's the not thing, but quite that's the, as pronounced. That's the thing. So if you if you're going to criminalise cocaine, you've got to criminalise alcohol as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And and the, if you also and like a thousand percent, if you're going to criminalise marijuana, you've got to. Yeah. You you have to like there's there's no 100%. argument for that at all because all marijuana makes you do is just fucking rap basically. Well, that's the thing. So if you asked a police a police officer, right, would they rather deal with someone who's high, yeah, on marijuana or pissed or pissed? Well, like, ho- yeah, every single time they're going to say the stoner because they're going to be docile as fuck, probably amenable, amenable and effectively completely out of it. Yeah. If you get someone riled up on booze. Trying to kind of detain them or talk sense into them, like yeah. m- more times than not, is going to end badly. It's going to end in violence typically yeah. because you you know you riled up or I think I don't know, but I don't believe there's any like cases of overdosing with marijuana, is there? Is I don't it? think so. I don't think I don't think like the psychoactive substance in marijuana, which is THC. I don't think you can overdose on it. That's what I mean. I think it could probably like fuck you up mentally if you smoke too much at once. Yeah. But, like, I don't think that would kill you. Oh, yeah, it would mess you up. Same as, like, psycho psychedelics, though, isn't it? Like, yeah, I don't might... think you can actually... Well, you probably can. If you had loads of mushrooms, you'd be fucked. But That's I don't what know, I mean, I don't know if you'd so, like, actually die. You could not like, reprogram your brain chemistry, which long-term could effectively, like, entirely derail your life. But, like, I don't think <laughs> directly it would kill you in the same way that you can get alcohol poisoning. Like, if you just keep drinking, your body will shut down. You know what's wild, though? It, because... Psychedelic. So this is the thing as well. Like drugs are going to be taken anyway. It doesn't matter if they if they're illegal or not. People are going to take drugs. So if people are going to take, say, for example, psychedelics, surely, surely teaching them that okay, for example, like a gram is going to do this, two mm. grams are going to do this. But if you take fifteen grams, you're probably going to be fucked. So like, surely, yeah, surely educating people on that is more productive than going. Actually, we're not going to have any. We're just going to turn a blind eye. Not going to have anyone. We're going to pretend no one takes it, and then. Shock it's, when someone takes too much because they haven't been told how much to take. They're they're absolutely fucked for their entire life. Like if you take if you do take too much mush, too many mushrooms, you can be fucking horrendous. Yeah. Well, this is David Nutt's whole thing, so he's all for harm reduction. So you, you basically reach acceptance to use our good friend Gareth Timmins' term. You don't stay in denial. You reach acceptance that basically people are going to take drugs. Yeah. And then you shape your policies around harm reduction instead of criminalising. 100%. Because if you criminalise people doing drugs and we accept the fact that people are going to take them anyway, you're just going to fill your prisons. Well, yeah, which is what's happened. And our prisons are fucking full anyway. Yeah, exactly. So it's um, it's a mad thing. I think... Um, the Remember the Boomtown drug tent? Yeah, they've they've canned that off now, I know, they? but wasn't that a great idea? Yeah. So, for, the, for anyone who doesn't know, basically at Boomtown, this festival we used to go to, a massive druggy festival, basically, in it? Like yeah, everyone takes drugs, and what they've done is just accepted that everyone's going to take fucking drugs. <laughs> yeah, so they've had this tent erected with, I guess, experts in or whatever who 
you can take your drugs to. So you've scored your drugs, however you've done it. You you can take your drugs into this tent. They'll test it, and they'll tell you actually what it is. Because you probably think, it's a, okay, it's ketamine. It's probably going to be 20% ketamine, 80% whatever fucking rat poison. Rat or whatever. poison or whatever. And so it. typically, I think it was like a mad stat that came out of that, like 75% of people who actually handed their drugs in said okay keep them because they're fucking like that, full of shit that's the thing so it's like an, it was like an amnesty bin wasn't it yeah so it's like once they'd tested your drugs if they were shit you could just hand them over yeah and they wouldn't penalise you they wouldn't and kick they, you out of the they festival. would actually give them back to you if you wanted them yeah, back as well, yeah. which is wild but I mean it's I fair uh, well, yeah, the, so the government have outlawed that now because it's encouraging drug use. Again, delusional, thinking that, oh, that's going to put people off taking them. Well, yeah, and if, you follow the num- anyway. if you follow the numbers, though, it actually discourages it. Yeah, exactly. It's fucking wild. It's just like they're, they're seeing what they want to see, and yeah. that's it. You know. Right, so now if we go into the negatives, I mean, we've already touched on some, but we'll, we'll outline them anyway. Uh, so from the individual, obviously, health is the main one. Well, yeah. Alcohol As is incredibly bad for you. you know. So I'll throw some statistics at you. Alcohol misuse is the biggest risk factor for death, ill health and disability among those aged 15 to 49 in the UK. It's a causal factor in over 60 medical conditions, including many cancers, high blood pressure, cirrhosis of the liver and depression. Well, yeah. I, I don't know how best to articulate this because it's just for me so obvious just the just the feeling is is so you know when you wake up with a hangover you've ingested something that's <laughs> you've ingested a toxin it's poisoning terrible you. for you yeah well you know there's nothing else that you can consume on a day-to-day basis that makes you feel like that <laughs> but the thing is imagine what, if what you had a chicken it makes you feel like that. but the thing is you can you can kind of like formulate balanced arguments about other things so is in it being like a social lubricant and stuff you can see both sides of the coin but i think in particular in terms of in the health of the individual consuming you can't defend it it's no. just so bad for you it's, it's like tobacco and it? it's like yeah. well, it's like um nicotine or whatever on the packet it says this kills you and that's accepted that yeah people still do it because they've got the choice but if there was something on you know inside alcohol branding that actually exemplified how bad it was for you like this is going to do x to you then people probably wouldn't people probably think twice at least about but there's nothing like that it's all like no it's all advertised it's all branded it's all like looks appetizing uh, and there's nothing around there's, there's no real narrative around how bad it is for you the big thing for me is sleep i think because people don't tend to realize people are, people think uh, tend to know if they do a shitload of binge drinking you know, they have like 20 units. They're probably going to be fucked. It's probably not great for him. People don't tend to realise how bad like just two pints is for you or just like two glasses of wine. Because people, like the amount of people who live like that day to day, like every night, two glasses of wine, every night, two pints with their dinner and after. Yeah. That literally derails your sleep to, to no end. Like you're, you're, you're getting, if you do that f- like forever, you're getting zero REM sleep ever. Which is, it's which, fucking which, mental which, but this is what I mean like it's just so whichever way you frame it it's just so bad for your health yeah and oh, there's obviously the calorie sort of in, in, impl, 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 implication because wine's super it's high dead in calories. calories your body literally can't do anything with the calories it consumes from booze no it just stores them so it's, it's like just, it's, yeah. it's basically carbohydrates that your body just stores and can't use for energy typically when you ingest carbohydrates you're using them for energy and walking around even if you're not active you, they're doing something yeah it's just fucking carrying extra weight around needlessly yeah which is why you get that beer belly that's exactly what that is yeah it's just straight to the stomach Um, so it, it's it's like you say indefensible for from a health perspective and then financially as well. So if it wasn't bad enough that it's basically killing you every time you drink, uh, financially as well, the average UK drinker spends around £50,000 on alcohol during their lifetime. If ever there was a reason to not drink, I think of all of them, that would trigger most people. 50 grand. So basically from like 18, if you just opt out of drinking, you'd be 50 grand better off at the end of your life than your mates. How much that... Um, <laughs> actually, so if we, so I know you wouldn't do this. But no, but if you think about it, so if you can't drink until you're 18, you yeah, sh- and you assume that your drinking age is about 50 years, so that's like so you stop drinking at 78 or whatever. Yeah, it's, but it's a grand a year. Yeah, so 250 makes sense. I was thinking between a couple, if you would spend 100 pound a weekend for from 18 for 50 years to so 68, 
260 grand. My, my parents <laughs> are the best example of this. Again, not to throw them under the bus, but you can only go off your lived experience. Yeah. I've seen them spend abhorrent countless amounts of money on booze. Yeah. And again, where's it's black hole? Like, where's it going? Is it, yeah, and I, obviously they would argue, and I see it to a certain extent that like it's a big part of how they socialise. So like, they've got a lot of friends, and like they've enjoyed their they've enjoyed their life. And I think they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I true. can't take that away from them because like that, that's that's their decision, isn't it? But like, I can't help think that you could do a lot more with, with that money. with a quarter of a million quid than just drink, basically. Yeah, the thing is, there's always going to be a counter argument. Well, I enjoy it, which is fine. Like that's great, but 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 the other thing, like, but could you enjoy something be, else more? Well, that's my point. So like, moderation, like, there has to be some some sort of give and take, like, like there is with everything. Like, I enjoy chocolate cake. I don't have it seven days a week. You know. Yeah. Like it's one of those things you have to just moderate it. It's like Rory Sutherland's like the, sometimes the opposite of a good idea. Is another, another good, good idea. idea. So yeah, you enjoy drinking. Yeah. But if you spent that money elsewhere, you might enjoy that more. Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. And and the time you get back, the productivity you get back, the energy you get back. Energy is your only currency. Energy and time. The only thing you don't ever get back. And like the only reason you can't do more things is because you haven't got more energy. Really, yeah. In it. And so. If you if if alcohol objectively each week is stealing energy from you, surely that's a fucking negative. Right, I don't when, get I, it. when I drink now on a weekend, like the loss in productivity that I notice, like the following week, is mental. Even if I only go out one day in the week, so if I just go out on Saturday for a few drinks, I'd even get paralytic. The impact that has on my sleep, and then like next day, yeah, the next two days, and the so next two days, and you get Thursday and you've done fuck all, and it's like, was that worth it? You know. You were talking about before about our like um, what's weaned us off alcohol effectively. I genuinely think the marathon build was a massive thing for that. So mm. that was the only reason really we had to have sober weekends. So there would be weekends where we'd do half marathons or doing really really long runs or whatever. You can't drink around those because that's stupid. So your long runs on Sunday morning, you're not gonna drink Friday because it's still gonna affect it. You're obviously not gonna drink Saturday. So those forced long weekend or forced weekends without alcohol were the only the only reason for that was because we were training for the marathon but the byproduct of it was okay fucking hell I feel much better on Monday I feel like I've got energy I can actually focus straight away when I get up rather than having this like fogginess and yeah. and whatever else it is uh, when you get up so I think there was a almost forced element to our uh, retraction of drinking but that was what allowed us to kind of see through the see th- see the wood through the trees a little bit, wasn't it? Yeah, see through the matrix. We yeah. re- we basically red pilled ourselves off booze. <laughs> yeah, but not intentionally. I think you you just kind of see, oh fucking hell, I feel a ton better. Here. I'm 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 not wait until Wednesday until I feel fucking productive again. Yeah, uh, but the thing is, if you booze through marathon prep, at best you're just going to come out of it unscathed. You're not going to build. You're not yeah, going to progress. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Because as soon as you have a boozy weekend, you undo like the, the previous few weeks worth of progress in terms of like lost sleep I think yeah and also like I think long running or endurance stuff certainly is a massive well, it's, it's the number one thing you can't do kind of hungover because if you try you're you're dehydra- dehydrated you're underslept so your time to fatigue is through the roof yeah. so like if you try and do a fucking 30k run off a hangover you're just going to be fucked yeah, well, what are the and three? No th- what, what are the three things you need basically for like long distance, like endurance running? You need fuel, hydration, hydration, and sleep. Yeah, and they're the three things that you don't have when you're hungover. Well, especially if you have a big night, you've probably gone to like the kebabby or whatever. Like, you know, you, you your fueling's through the through the. Shit like, if up. you're fit, you can probably cuff like half five k, ten k at a push half. Yeah, you can't cuff a full marathon. Or like a longer training run, no. like twenty plus miles. So like it's it's one of those things that I think forces you into it. But it was very productive. Again, I don't think I would have experienced the sort of perspective shift or or the difference between a week where I drank on the weekend and a week where I hadn't drank on the weekend without that. So that was kind of a really cool thing. So if you can takeaways, I guess if you can like commit to something, which we always say to book an event or book a race but if you can do something that's pretty far out of your comfort zone because then it forces you because if you book like a high rocks fucking you can just rock up to that right you can do yeah. it I mean well, we you're not going to do be- you're not going to do great maybe you're not going to do your best but you can just fucking rock up if 
you book something that's really like an ultra or a marathon if you're not yeah. a runner or whatever then you have to commit and you have to do something about that so I think it's it's one of those things that maybe you have to look at something that maybe intimidates you a little bit maybe scares you a little bit uh, and then you probably force yourself off, off it anyway yeah right so we move on to the negatives from a societal perspective I'll throw some more stats at you yeah uh, so from the perspective of crime in 2016-17 40 of all violent crime involved the offender being under the influence of alcohol 40 percent. yeah so basically wild. half of all violent crimes caused by booze yeah yeah so there's i'm gonna uh, go on I'll, I'll bore you in a second but. all right okay and then obviously <laughs> there's the economic so we were talking about like the drinks industry always peddle the idea that they can make loads of money from taxation on booze mm -hmm. but if you actually unpack how much it costs the taxpayer so alcohol harm can cost society 21 billion annually in the uk and if you break that down 3.5 billion onto the nhs 11 billion uh alcohol related crimes 7.3 billion in lost productivity yeah so again there's no argument for that taxation thing, no which how much did, did you say how much the tax was Generally, oh no I don't what in terms of how much like, you can make yeah, you from... can offset it no I don't know okay yeah so that's the figure's expensive. probably out there if you're interested or just yeah know. yeah well, add all those together and then just detract uh, subtract whatever um, the taxation is and, and you probably you definitely still have a fucking net loss but I always think that like people that are on the wagon come out worse out of this and you're taxpayers who don't drink yeah because you're basically you're just you're just facilitating someone else's alcoholism someone else's bad habits <laughs> yeah yeah, uh, so linking back to your um, your forty percent of of uh, violent violent crime was it? Yeah. yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. So there's a a thing that I've learnt through jujitsu, but it sort of just makes sense. It's it's kind of a combative score that you'd have from a uh, interaction. Have I told you about this before? Like a oh, you go off quite yeah, a lot about jujitsu. Well, anyway, I, ten, I tend to zone. You out. can listen now. So we're running here. So so. Uh, Every every interaction you have has a combative st combative score from one to ten. If it's ten, you're scrapping. But up until that point, there's a build, and the argument is every um, interaction that, that it escalates towards violence either is ego driven or alcohol driven or mix of the two. So if someone squeezes your missus' ass on the way past, mm. that's your ego. But you you could easily brush that off. If if you we're having a conversation now, the combative score, combative energy is pretty much zero. Mm. If you know, I say something, say something to you that ele elevates a little bit. Um, but there's always the option to bring it down a little bit. So if I bring zero to every interaction where yeah. I've had no no ego and no alcohol, pretty much, unless someone comes in with a 10 and just instantly fucking smacks me, basically, there's never going to be a scrap, which is why I think I've really never been in that many fights because I always try and bring either a, a detraction or a zero. Um, because I think if you're bringing... If you, if you bring even a two, three or whatever and you just a little bit, give a little bit, then if they're already at foot six or seven, you're scrapping already. Yeah. And so I think if you're someone who maybe, um, if you're ever worried about, ambiently worried about violence or, or being a victim of that, I think there's there's an argument for take some personal responsibility and just be kind of passive and go, okay, fucking well, okay, I didn't want any, any trouble or whatever and you can just leave it. And if, your ego might have taken a bit of a, a, bit of a dig. Well, actually, you're probably okay. Um, if you're that worried about it, just remove yourself from anywhere where there might be someone drinking, because then you reduce your chances of being involved with violent crime by fifty percent, well, basically. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Because, well, definitely, I think ego times alcohol is almost a cert. Yeah, <laughs> in it. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I think we've gone into quite a lot of detail there about why alcohol is potentially very damaging to the individual and society I'd agree we've detailed our own personal experiences of booze mm -hmm. and how we've come to the position where we are now where we kind of like pretty much leave it behind us with the exception of kind of like special occasions yeah. and stuff yeah and obviously we'll, d we'll dabble in non-alcoholic beers and stuff like that yeah yeah so let's now as is tradition so OG listeners will remember this we'll now put together a manifesto of alcohol related policy we're doing three we're going to do three and uh, these policies are things that we think realistically could be implemented that would be a net net positive to society in relation to drinking okay cool let's go through them yeah, so we'll start with the sensible one first, as is tradition. Yeah. So this is minimum unit pricing, and this already exists in places like Scotland and Wales, I believe, in France. Okay. Interesting that it exists in Scotland and Wales and not England. 
Yeah, oh, exactly. I don't know. This is probably to do with the deep pockets of the drinks industry in the UK mm. and the, the kind of stranglehold it has over Parliament. Yeah, yeah, pro- I'd imagine so. So for anyone so that doesn't understand, that. yeah, so anyone that doesn't understand, it's it does what it says on the tin. So there's a minimum, there's a minimum cost per unit of alcohol. So you can't sell alcohol for under a certain price. So things like K cider and fucking Frosty Jacks or whatever become more expensive right yeah yeah so like basically the stronger something is the more expensive it is because yeah, there's yeah. more units of alcohol in it yeah so we used to buy a case either which is like nine is it eight percent nine percent yeah Something eight like and that. a half percent yeah for one pound a can yeah which is insane so this it? so this so yeah so this kind of uh, the alcohol that you're on about which is kind of like cheap but very strong disproportionately is drunk by vulnerable people i.e people with like alcoholism drug users stuff and kids yeah, and they're the two portions of society you don't want to be drinking, basically. Well, hundred percent, and 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 people with like in low low income housing. Yeah. So according to a report by Public Health Scotland, uh, by implementing minimum unit pricing in 2018, I think, uh, it's reduced alcohol specific deaths by 14 percent and stopped over 800 hospital admissions every year in Scotland. It's a no brainer, isn't it? Really. Yeah, it's only a population of three. F- like 5 million people as well but if we look at percentages yeah it's quite high it's just proportional isn't it Um, so you take 40 like percentage of uh, the same percentage of Scottish population to English population it's going to be huge Scotland probably drinks more than England I guess maybe maybe. I mean it's a stereotype you'd probably (laughs) safely say yeah they're definitely like 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 a like a beer yeah per capita yeah yeah, yeah. alcohol alcohol consumption is probably slightly higher in Scotland yeah maybe uh, but if it so exactly as so if it can work there, and it's worked in France as well. Yeah, that's true. Home of home of wine. Yeah. So, I would imagine that would work. Uh, wonders, like you say, for those p- specific populations who drink that disproportionately strong. Yeah, the the bottom booze. shelf like paint stripper stuff, basically. Yeah. It basically, is the worst type of booze to consume, and the the portions of society that you don't want to be drinking disproportionately go for that type. Well, the of issue booze. with that kind of stuff is. The only motive for drinking that kind of stuff is to get leather. Is to get leather. Yeah, There's yeah. no enjoyment <laughs> There's from no, that. Is having, there? having consumed my fair share of drinks like Buckfast K-Cider. and K-Cider and Frosty yeah. Jacks, there's no pleasure there. It's all business. Yeah, it's all you business. <laughs> you, it's all a means to an end. Yeah, exactly. Which, again, is never going to be productive because if we're just facilitating people getting blackout drunk <laughs> blackout drunk does not equal good decisions no yeah, so. it's like you want to undo binge drinking culture because that's the destructive element of drinking yeah well largely yeah I would argue that the consistent consumption of alcohol isn't great either but you know so that's one policy that's a bit boring but it would actually make a lot of sense this is my own policy that I've aptly named the one to one policy yeah right. I quite like this so this <laughs> In layman's terms, for every unit of alcohol you consume, the following week you have to do an hour of hard fizz. Yeah, and by the way, a unit is fuck all. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, if you have a pint, you've got to do like an hour, like ninety minutes of hard fizz the following week, and it's 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 totaled up in the week. So you attach Garmin's to everyone, and they can, uh, you know, they yeah, can track. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I haven't quite got into the intricacies of how this is policed yet, but uh, as a general principle, I can get on board with it. So well, how how many units of alcohol are in a bottle of wine? Ten. You? Ten, right? So That's if you, wild. So if you drink a bottle of wine on a Friday or something, you know net the following week you're going to spend a lot of your time in the gym. You could do it like um, active minutes are, are done on Garmin. So you have like mo- low, low intensity exercises, just like one to one. Mm. Vigorous exercises, like two to one. So if you'd had like right. three hours to yeah, do, yeah, yeah. and you smashed it for a couple of hours, then you, you'd probably get that done quicker. I think that would be a good way to do it. Because otherwise people have just had no, no time for it. Yeah, Joe, I like that. So the more vigorous you are, the quicker you basically earn Get it done. Yeah, it's heart rate back. related. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, And it's like a tax or something if you don't make it, if you don't do but it. But like, it's like an eye for an eye then. Like you earn the send. If you can't be asked to earn it, you don't get it. Could you backlog it? I mean, as in, could you like, or forward log it, I guess. Could you kind of like, on say it's Saturday and you go and do a shitload of fizz and then you have, you have like, an allotment of, of alcohol you can you can then drink and then it spills over into yeah like, there's a lot of ration stamps yeah yeah so yeah. it's like so what we were on about earlier with our marathon preps so we didn't drink for like a good few months they all backlog then yeah and all those true. minutes of activity build up in tokens so then you can have like a good one or two sends at the end of it yeah and not have to worry 
because you've done the, done the work. Yeah. Same year, same calendar year. You got tax years. Do, do the same with that. It, that is a sensible thing, I think. And and again, would probably force a lot of people who don't get anywhere near the general recommended daily uh, weekly allowance of, of um, activity. But you were to on, get closer. But as we were on about the whole point of this podcast is he's kind of preaching the idea of drinking moderation. That forces people to drink in moderation because they or then to do a shitload of fizz. <laughs> well, because like anything that they drink, they then have to counterbalance with physical activity. Yeah, That's yeah, moderation, yeah. and it's one to it's one to one, like we said. Yeah, I think that's a great one. Uh, I, I genuinely think that's not too extreme. <laughs> well, the thing is, like, if you unpack it, it doesn't sound extreme and it sounds plausible. But because our actual politics are so far removed from reality, it does seem implausible, if that makes sense. Because you could never see that getting passed through Parliament. Oh, no, it wouldn't Even be. though it kind of does make sense. Well, because imagine what the, the impact it'd have on the actual politicians passing it. Because yeah, yeah. they're all unfit as fuck and probably drink shitloads of wine. Mate, the house, have you seen about the House of Commons bar? Yeah, exactly. So, the, yeah. so it's, I think it stayed open through COVID, and obviously because it's subsidised by taxpayers, pints in there are like fifty p or summer. Yeah, so they just smash it. It's bollocks that. Uh, I'd love to see, you know, Bozza out on his fucking ones and twos because well, he's we been, have, haven't we? No, we but like that. properly. Oh, like pro- not like an like orchestra doing his fucking one to one. Not like an orchestrated yeah, like photo. No, shit, no, no. Like doing he... his fucking one to one, and yeah. again, it's tracked by like third party company come in. Everyone has an activity tracker, and and then if you don't get that allotment of fizz done, it's some sort of penalty or financial because that's all, all anyone cares about. Like a tax penalty or something. Yeah, you pay more tax. tax. We were talking about this the other day. We we? They, they this, should that's be, genius, isn't it? There really? should be financial incentive, like like tax incentives, to do more physical activity. That's this is a, a no brainer. This is a Rory Sutherlandism. This is yeah. If you're familiar with marketing guru that he is, and if you're not, you should be. Yeah. So we think that you sh- there should be very clear financial tax incentives to do more fizz. So if you get your steps in in like a ta- in a if you get all of your kind of like seven thousand steps a day for an entire kind of like tax year, you can you, offset that. You can offset. The tax you pay. Yeah, exactly. That's a great idea. Because you like, you watch how many people would suddenly start getting their fucking steps in. Yeah. Oh, suddenly you've got an hour that you can do a fucking well, exactly. walk. Oh, mad. So like if you have ten thousand steps a day, for example, as, as like a minute, like a little little target. That's like three hundred sixty-five thousand steps a year, for example. You can then offset that as like a maybe divide it, whatever. But you get three hundred sixty-five pounds or whatever to set offset against tax, or it's just some, somehow it's, then, it's worked out. But then, like the government would counteract that and say, "Well, oh, think about all the think about basically all the money we're then forking out to line people's pockets." But if you yeah. think how much lost product, how much money is lost in productivity from drinking of alcohol, then Hank, yeah. Think how much productivity would be gained from those increasing steps because people would be fitter, they'd be healthier, they'd have more energy. Yeah, well, this is, and again, like, in terms of just the extreme of that, in terms of, like, obesity and that costing the NHS money and stuff like that, like, if people, if people, if, like, really, really, really fat people did 10,000 steps every day. They wouldn't day, be fat. They would struggle to be fat. You'd have to really dig out to be fat. To do ten k steps a day is quite a bit, to be honest. But you, you, I mean, you could do it. But you, could, I think, being really, really fat would be out of the question because you couldn't actually do ten thousand steps a day if you were really, really fat. But then, if we offered people the tax incentive, people would probably then have like a period of like dieting where they got down to a weight where they could walk ten thousand steps a day. Yeah, and then when they got to that, then they could start walking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Some sort I, of like get in clause like some sort of like well yeah just no just like up. just practically like because some people who are like morbidly obese like physically can't do 10,000 steps you know because like their yeah their anatomy won't allow it because there's just so much weight like yeah, they would crumble yeah, yeah. but like if they starve themselves a bit got got themselves down to a more kind of like moderate weight yeah. then started walking and they're laughing well exactly or you could like change it for like minutes on an exercise bike or something like that yeah, yeah. just, just physical be. activity minutes yeah well exactly that it's so it's so easy. That's such a no brainer. Get that. us in government. Yeah, man. I know. Fucking brew brothers for profits. Uh, uh, anyway, and then the third one was one that you actually pitched the other day. Yeah. So early closes and like alcohol curfews, which I yeah. think again is sensible and it's worked in other places around the world. So America has this. America's drinking culture is a little bit strange from a British point of view. The only thing this does do is make people start earlier. However, I still think that's productive because past a certain point in the night, everything goes downhill. This is Chris Williams. Yeah, it's past one a.m. 
fuck all happens that's, that's productive or good yeah and so if you make everything shut at one thirty or 2 a.m because the, the thing is these places I, I was thinking about these when i said this these places that open till like 6 a.m as are mate you know a shit mate nothing happens there that's good well, I'll use the example of Gorgeous in Wolverhampton. Yeah. Remember that back in the day? Yeah, I don't yeah. think it's open anymore, so we're not gonna get Luckily. we're not gonna get sued for this. Yeah. But this was this was the place that was open till six or seven AM. Everyone would flock there after kind of like Waits's Yates's Yates's closed wine lodge. I mean, is yeah. Yates still a thing? I think so. Yeah, so after Yates is closed anyway, and then like Slug and Let is closed or whatever, everyone would flock there. Notice how no one would go there before those places closed. Because it's, it's shit. Yeah, right. it's, it's only the only place. It's supply and demand. Yeah. Uh, and so if it's the only place open, everyone's going to go there. And obviously, that place is then getting flooded with people. Well, it's, it's going to be too busy, first of all. Everyone's already been drink, drinking for seven yeah. hours. All the types of punters you don't want. People yeah. are already pissed and they're not buying drinks. Yeah. And they're at their most potentially rowdiest. Well, 100%. So I don't get... I think close all them fuckers down. Yeah, close all them down. Don't do like late licences. Fuck yeah. them off. Everything while clo- we're at it as well, let's stop with these fucking 24 hours fast food chains. <laughs> Who needs them, mate? Because at the end of the night out, we've all been there. I'm bad for it. When you're pissed, we've obviously talked about you're not making sensible decisions. Yeah. If you see a juicy kebab fucking spinning around in a window, you're obviously going to buy one, aren't you? Of course. You? Of course. No one needs a Mackey's at 4am. No. Nobody ever. Ever. Apart from a truck driver, maybe. But, you know. But, like, if you've ever consumed one of these kebabs or, like, cheesy chips at the end of a night out and have then thrown it up, like, the following morning oh, or something, it's, it. it's all still just sat in your stomach. Yeah, because you can't digest any Cause of it. Because you can't digest any of it. So, again, what what good is that doing to your body? Yeah, and this is where, like, And it doesn't even taste good. Action. It doesn't taste good. It's not like, you know, when you dig out on, like, a nice meal and you enjoy it. Yeah. You're pissed. So you don't... You, mate, you could be eating fucking grass and it would, just, like, taste all right. Yeah. Whereas you just want some, some sustenance, some calories. You've been dancing your heart away. But, like, you know, th- again, those should... Cl- so you close, like, nightclubs and the bars and that at one thirty. Yeah. Those close at 2. Yeah. You have an half-hour window to get in there. If not, you're fucking... Out of luck, mate. And then also supermarkets should have a curfew and when they can sell alcohol as well. Yeah. This yeah. is another big one. So I think there's a big thing in antisocial drinking in terms of like... Because back in the day, if you went to the pub, your local pub, say, when people still had like a local and you knew everyone in there, if you repeatedly turned up and were just a piss can, people would have a word, you know, yeah. and eventually like the like the, the person that owns it basically would have a word with you. Yeah. Like you're pissing yeah. off, you're pissing off the locals, you're pissing off everyone. Like sort yourself out. Now that you can drink at home, you can bypass that kind of like social pressure to actually sort yourself out. True, because you can, and then like the world's your oyster then, because no <laughs> one's stopping you. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I think you're right. That it all comes in one. That doesn't it? Like late night food shop obviously closing, um, supermarkets having a curfew, and and obviously a curfew on when other establishments can sell alcohol as well. and like landlords obviously have the power to not serve you if they think you've had enough yeah yeah, yeah they do chances, they never exercise that exactly chances are shopkeeper will just let you buy booze yeah yeah typically do you know yeah. what I mean because it's not really in their interest to not serve you because you're, you're not going to be in their place yeah unless you're immediately being kind of like violent or antisocial in the shop they'll just serve you so basically if you can hold yourself together for five minutes they'll yeah. serve you yeah yeah, I think all of those those three genuinely, if they were implemented, would probably have a massive effect. Yeah, the economy on, be, on everything. The on economy like, will be better off. Let's be honest, the economy needs it right now. Yeah, because it's down the fucking toilet. Yeah, so get us in office, mate. People would be healthier. Yeah. and more fulfilled. Can't have that though. Can't. So, yeah, we need people. Then people to be won't be rotting in front of Netflix. Yeah, we need no. people to be suppressed so they're more easily controlled. Yeah, so it's just getting conspiratorial. Yeah, we'll, we'll nip it <laughs> in the Joe Rogan. We'll, we'll nip it in the bud before we go full Rogan. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, was a, that was a good episode, I think. Um, have you got anything you want to add? Any final thoughts? Well, what's our final position? We need to okay, yeah. So we've done our yeah. policies now. We need a final position on booze. Okay, I really. think... Really, so people can have a solid take-home message of what the Br- Brummy Brothers' outlook on booze is now. Okay, I would say... Um, so, special occasions... I think if you're not at a special occasion but you want to go and socialise or whatever, great. Non-alcoholic beer, that's where that comes in. Yeah. Because it's great now. Some of them are great. I think as we go through like next three, four, five years, 
they'll be much much better again like the, that athletic brewing is really really good yeah. but it's not everywhere like you can you probably couldn't get it where, where, where we are now but and I think again like up north fucking hell if you were to order it in Glasgow or somewhere you'd be fucking like well, it's, get out it's quite timely that we've filmed this episode in the northwest of England because this this must be the location with the exception of Glasgow that has the most pubs per capita yeah, in the shit UK. Loads, there's so many. It's like one every three buildings in a well, town yeah. centre is a pub. Yeah, literally. Uh, which is like it's like a village as well. It's not even a town. Yeah, really. uh, yeah. So I would say special occasions, yes. And again, like knowing your limit, I think is the is the big thing. Like, don't I don't think committing to being absolutely rat ass is ever productive. No, that's my that's my viewpoint. Yeah. I would say, obviously, it's just a bit of a throwaway cliche comment. It's like drink in moderation. But I would take it further and be like, try not to drink unless it's a special occasion, like you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then, then you'll enjoy it more because it's a rarity and it's a treat. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And um, I don't know, it's difficult, isn't it? Because but it's Yeah, so but then at the same time, if, you got, if you're listening to this and you're like 18 now, don't be too hard on yourself because we're like seven, eight years older than you. I think it is a right of passage to a certain extent. Certainly culturally. Culturally in the UK, I think, you know, you need to go out. It's part of kind of discovering who you are. And like, we, as you said, we only know this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through a process of elimination because we've been there and done it. And also in terms of like, uh, so when you're navigating that, the world of... Of women or whatever, and in that in that sort of period of your life, can't say I've done that very really successfully. In that period of your life, though, where you're kind of you know you're like you say you're discovering who you are, discovering what you're kind of into, and that your approach anxiety is fucking horrendous. Like mm. it's, it is for me now. I'm 26 yeah, and pretty confident, good. but like it's horrendous. When you're 18, 19, it's going to be even worse. You haven't got self confidence. You haven't got anything built up yet. So that alcohol bridges the gap a little bit for that. So I think that is important because otherwise you're just never going to fucking ever speak to anyone, mm. which is which is not ideal. But I think if you can stop drinking on dates, stop drinking on dates, I'm a massive fucking hypocrite. But anyway, um, you know, if you can, go and take someone for a walk or do something you know, yeah. wholesome or whatever because you will genuinely then re- figure out if you like them or if you don't. A date isn't a special occasion, by the way. When you said drinking on special occasions, yeah. a date isn't a special occasion. It should be anyway, and if it's not, then you should probably like go and watch our dating and relationships episode. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, um, but one final thing then, so we'll circle back right to the beginning. Mm. If it was discovered today, do you think alcohol would be illegal? I think there's a high chance. I think if all drugs came in now, and you say, okay, these are the drugs we've got. Yeah. Let's section them off in terms of which one's going to be illegal, which one's not. I think the the landscape would be far different. Yeah. Far different. I think psychedelics would be, be legal but moderated. I think marijuana would be legal. I think alcohol would be probably legal but moderated again. Or far far more moderated like we've said. And then the rest of them would probably be illegal. Yeah. yeah. So if you press the reset button. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. basically based our drug classification system on science, not morals. Yeah. I think alcohol would be illegal. You think it would be just but completely I think illegal. ecstasy would be legal. Ooh. And we'll leave it on that. Nice. Luna, anything to add? No. no. Okay, cool. All right, that's uh, that's us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And um, yeah, let us know what you think about booze in the in the comments. Don't berate us too much. We're just uh, boring, boring folk now. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>